Hello, and welcome to another episode of Grasping Scripture. Again, I'm glad you could join us as we continue, in this case, our journey through the book of Genesis. We've made it to the 13th chapter, and it's kind of a transition and a setup for the chapters that are going to immediately follow it, dealing with Abraham, Lot, and the Promised Land. So, Let's go ahead and join together as we look at this passage of scripture. And if you've been part of this study, welcome back. If you're new to the podcast, then I encourage you back up. Start at the beginning of Genesis. It'll just make more sense by the time you get to this point. You'll have the background uh, that we've already laid. So here we are at chapter 13. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and then dig into the text. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for providing us with your word, that we may study it, that we may meditate upon it, that we may apply it to our lives and our hearts as you have shown us yourself through your word. And you have given us record of interaction of us, your your creation of humanity, interacting with you and you interacting with us. Lord, help us to take encouragement from this text, knowing that you are there and that you love us and we can trust in you. And most of all, Father, we thank you for your gift of yourself in the flesh of Jesus the Christ, who atoned for our sins. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So as we left off in chapter 12, the Pharaoh had told Abraham or Abram at this point to pack up and leave Egypt, you know, take his stuff and go. In fact, had his military escort Abram to the border to be sure that he did leave. Now that's into the Sinai desert, uh, the Sinai area. Uh, crossing into the Negev, which is the the desert area or wilderness area south of Israel or the southern part of Israel. It is uh, not a great place to to just build a a permanent residence. It's it's a pretty rough area. It is the, the wilderness that the children of Israel some 400 plus years later are going to be wandering about in. So here we go. That's where they are. Chapter 13, verse 1 picks up right there. So Abram left Egypt and he traveled north into the Negev along with his wife and Lot and all they owned. Now you remember Lot is his nephew, son of his brother who passed. And then Lot has been part of Abram's household for, well, most of his life at this point and was in Egypt with them. And as his herds grew in Egypt and he received favor from the Pharaoh and gifts from the Pharaoh and the court, possessions grew. So now we know it's Abram, his family, and it's Lot all there. Verse two says, Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. That's that's verse two. So you, we know he's he's very rich. He's doing well. God has provided for him. Verse three, from the Negev, they continued traveling by stages towards Bethel. Now you remember Bethel means house of the Lord. Um, Bethel was a city that he had camped outside of between Bethel and I. And that's where he goes back. So in stages, they traveled toward Bethel and they pitched their tents between Bethel and I. So they're back where they had been before the famine, before they had to move to Egypt for food and to be taken care of. God blessed them while they were in Egypt, even though Abram wasn't necessarily following God well. He was lying about Sarah being his, or Sarai being his wife and some things like that. But Now, back on course, and now they have moved back to between Bethel and Ai, except they've been restored to the place that they started with more than they had previously. So it looked like it might have been a hardship. Have to flee because there's there's famine. There's not enough food. Usually famine in that area is brought on by drought. Um, They went through hardship. 
And even though he didn't practice the best of obedience to God and didn't practice um, maybe placing as much trust in God as he should have, God still took them through a difficult situation, led them to move to a place that was not their home, but then brought them back and in the process blessed them, restored them to where they had started, but restored them better than they had started. Um, there, there's something to be said there. Uh, there's something to be noticed about the way God works. Uh, sometimes we expect God's blessing just to happen the way we want it to. And often God has a different plan. He has a, His plan is to shape us and mold us into what He desires us to be and what He created us to be. A lot of times our plans want the shortcut that doesn't really make the change. God took Abram and the extended family through hardship, but in the midst of the hardship, blessed them. As um, there's a phrase I picked up years ago working with youth as we were looking at at the first part of the book of James uh, about suffering trials and growing in your faith through suffering trials. And, you know, the, the phrase kind of fits here. It's not just the phrase is not just go through it, but grow through it. Um, Abraham and Lot grew. Uh, they were they were physically blessed, but I think Abraham also learned, or Abram learned a lesson about trusting God completely. He was willing to trust God in so many things, but when it came to trusting in God for his own safety, he felt he had to lie and manipulate the situation to fix it himself, which came back to bite him. But God still blessed. All right, verse five. Lot, who was traveling with Abram, had also become very wealthy with flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle, and many tents. So these are a couple of large um, sheep, goat, cattle operations here. That takes space. So we get to verse 6. But the land could not support both Abram and Lot with all their flocks and herds living so close together. So disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot. At the time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. So we get a little aside there to tell us, hey, there were other tribes of people living there. It was the Canaanites and the Perizzites at this point. Now what's happening? Well, space is limited and conflict has started to take place. Now how is that conflict dealt with? Do Abraham and Lot divide up and go to war with each other? Uh, do they decide, hey, we're going to conquer the Canaanites and the Perizzites and take over their land so we've got more space? Well, in verse 8, we see how Abram dealt with it. And I think he dealt with it in a very um, faithful way, a way that was very trusting of God. So let's take a look at it. It says in verse 8, Finally, Abram said to Lot, now, we don't know when finally was. We know that there were these disputes breaking out. We don't know how long this went on. But it reached a point where Abram finally said to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. Oh, there's leadership. I mean, uh, really, I mean, that's leadership. There's something there for the church to learn from. In the body of Christ, we need to learn to deal with conflict in a redemptive and beneficial way. There is going to be conflict, okay? That's not a sin. How we deal with that conflict makes all the difference. In fact, it is part of our witness. When the lost and broken world sees the church and believers dealing, the fellowship of Christ dealing with, with conflict exactly the same way they do, that sends a message, and it's not a good one. In fact, it pushes them away from the gospel, because what we're presenting to them is not the gospel. But when they see us as the family of faith, as the body of Christ, 
working to resolve conflict in a redemptive way, a way that builds up, that is a profound witness that something is different here. That there is something at work here that isn't in the rest of the world. So finally, Abraham said to Lot, verse 8, Let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we are close relatives. Makes sense. It's an uncle and nephew, an uncle that raised the nephew, you know, for years have been part of the household. What if we as believers, as part of the body of Christ, said, hey, let's not allow this conflict to come between us. Because after all, we're close relatives. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, adopted into the household of God. Why don't we say that more? Because it's the truth. It is the reality that we live in and we are called to live out. That should challenge us. Verse 9, the whole countryside is open. This is Abram talking a lot. He says, the whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want, and we will separate. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll go to the left. I mentioned kind of prefacing this, that the way Abram decides to deal with this is a way that really shows faith and trust in God. And it does. When he is willing to say, you know, you pick it. We've we've got to divide things up. We've got to separate, get some distance between us. We know that's the solution. I am willing to relinquish my authority in this. He was the senior, the elder. He had the right to go, this is what we're going to do. I'm taking this part and you're going to go that way. But instead, he knew no matter which way it goes, God will provide. The God who has provided, who is providing, will provide. So it doesn't matter if I get the land to the right or the land to the left. It's going to be land that God blesses and cares for us in. So this is an act of faith. This is Abram saying, I'm placing my trust in God here. I'm not pulling rank. I'm not throwing my weight around. In fact, I'm going to leave it open to you. This whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want, and we will separate. We'll get some distance. If you want the land on the left, take the land on the, I will take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, I'll go to the left. Abram is deferring to Lot's choice here, which is really backwards to that patriarch or patristic world, it's um, it's not the way things would normally happen. But again, Abram is operating from the framework of, yeah, I've tried to control things, saw how that worked out in Egypt. I know I can trust God. So, hey, you pick it. I'll be fine wherever because God's got this. And so there's where they part company. There is how they separate. Verse 10. In verse 10, it says, Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord, or or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So before that, he's looking at the whole Jordan Valley going, oh yeah, that's the place. It's lush. It is well watered. It is garden-like. I mean, I've got animals that graze and there is plenty to graze on. This is the place. 
Verse 11, Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan. That would have been to the west instead of the east. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of that area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Now, there's an interesting shift that takes place here. Did you notice it? They split. And they split based on Lot's choice. Lot looked at the fertile valley or fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. And the whole area was well watered like a garden, like the garden of the Lord or, or the beautiful land of Egypt that is along the Nile. This was before, you know, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by the Lord. And Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He's going, that's where I'm going to go. He went there with his flocks and servants, and he parted company with his uncle Abraham. They're living in tents. They're out there with their flocks. They have lived their whole lives this way, and God has blessed it. But Lot gets out there in the abundance of the plain around the Jordan Valley, and then he does something else. It says, so Abram settled in the land of Canaan. I remember even his his camping out there between Bethel and I. He didn't go into either city. He camped out between because his was a large concern. And, you know, there are issues bringing that into town or on the outskirts of a town could be seen as invaders or whatever. Abram moved to the land of Canaan. Lot moved his tents. Where did he move them? To a place near Sodom. And he settled among the cities of the plain. Now, I'm not trying to draw this, this dichotomy in life between rural life and urban life, although I do have lots of opinions on that. Um, Throughout Genesis at this point, the gathering of people together, the desire to build these large cities or cities and, and grow those cities was a bit of arrogance on the part of humanity. I mean, not that God said don't build cities, but he wanted us to go and, and scatter and fill the earth. And whenever the people gathered, whether it be pre-flood or post-flood, I mean, this is just a couple chapters past the whole Tower of Babel bit. When the people gathered in cities, they became arrogant and they started looking to themselves for their own prosperity, to themselves for their own strength and protection, instead of looking to God. Lot seems to have been drawn in by the lure of the cities of the plains because he didn't settle out in the Jordan Valley that was so lush. He settled in the plains, which part of the lower Jordan Valley to the east of, of what is now the Dead Sea. But he settled there among the cities Hmm. That's a little shift. Now we'll come back to Lot, but you know, that sets the stage for some of what goes on with Lot versus what goes on with Abram. And part of it is that, you know, Abram was trusting in God and following God. Lot was trying to secure his own way forward. He was looking out there going, well, this is the best land. I'm going to go here. And he chooses it. And then once he gets there, he goes, oh, look at the cities. I'm going to go there. That's not the best course forward. And not just for him, but for us. For us to survey life and go, ooh, 
there's what I'm going to do because that's the best option. It's kind of an arrogant thing to say. Again, to borrow from James, uh, paraphrasing James's letter to the church, he, he warns against saying, oh, I'm going to go over to this city for two or three years and I'm going to do business and become wealthy. And he says, no, there's arrogance there. You do not control that. You need to say, if the Lord wills it or if the Lord allows, I'm going to go do this in expectation of this outcome, if that's what the Lord has planned. Not, this is what I'm going to do. I can see the options before me. I'm picking one and that's it. We must acknowledge God because as much as we like to pretend we are in control, we are not. But God is. And if we'll pay attention to him and we'll focus on him and following him and trusting in him, he will guide our steps. We can be like Abram and go, you know, pick one. I'll go with the other one. I'll be fine. Abram didn't look at it and go, well, you know, Jordan Valley, that's the best land out here. Look at how watered it. I mean, it's like the Garden of Eden over there. That would be perfect for raising our herds and just an awesome place to live. I mean, look at it. So I'm going to take that one lot. You can, you can have the rest of this. He didn't do that. He trusted that whatever lot chose, he would take the rest of it and it would be fine in God's hands. Which path do we choose in our life? Do we choose to trust God and the faithfully follow him? Or do we choose the path of, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to learn what the best path is, or I'm going to assess the situation, and I'm going to choose what is most favorable to me, and I'm going to go for it. Because our vision is limited. We don't know what tomorrow brings. In fact, we don't even know if what we're basing our decision on is true when we look at it, when we assess it, because it's all from our perspective or or based on the information we've been given. And often those things lie to us. Following our heart, our heart lies to us. But God is truth. And we can trust in him. So really, this decision-making that we see happening here comes down to a question of faith. And Lot did what he deemed was best. And then he was enticed. He moved his tents near to a place named Sodom among the cities of the plains. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against God. If Lot were looking at pursuing the Lord, he would have looked at the people, not just the place. He wouldn't look to the cities for security. He would look to the cities and go, yeah, I don't think so. That's not who I want to be before God. Now, as we move into the end of this chapter, 14 through 18, in 14, it says, After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look, as far as you can see in every direction, north, south, east, west, I am giving all this land, as far as you can see, to you and your descendants, as a permanent possession. That's a relevant statement right there. Given our world today and the disputes over the, um, the boundaries of, of the nation Israel and whether, whether Israel should even exist. And, and I know modern Israel exists based on a decision of the United Nations back in 1948, but, um, 
you know, what did God say to Abram? And I know both Arabs and Jews claim Abram as their father, their descendants, whether through Isaac or Ishmael. But this is the promise given by God to Abram. Look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession or you and your seed it translates means descendants, basically offspring as a permanent possession. Hmm. Yeah. That permanent word there is kind of significant. God established that this was the land of promise, the land promised to Abram and his descendants. Now, did the Israelites always have possession of it? No. No, they didn't. Um, Babylon had possession of it for a while. The Canaanites had possession of it at this point in time. And, you know, during the 400 plus years of captivity in in Egypt but still the promise of God permanent possession verse 16 and I will give you so many descendants like the dust of the earth they cannot be counted go and walk through the land in every direction for I am giving it to you see he let Lot pick where Lot wanted to be Abram did trusting that God would provide for him. And as soon as they had separated after Lot had gone, then the Lord said to Abraham, Hey, look, everything you can see in every direction, it's yours. It's your descendants, permanent possession. And I'm going to give you so many descendants. They're going to be like dust on the earth. They cannot be counted. Now we know from New Testament, those descendants aren't just the physical descendants, but they are the spiritual descendants. All those who come to trust in God and know God through Christ are some of those descendants too. As Paul talks about it, grafted in to that tree. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth. You ever tried counting dust? Yeah, no. Um, they can't be counted. So he says, go and walk through the land in every direction for I am giving it to you. And then we get to verse 18. So Abram moved his camp to Hebron and he settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. There he built another altar to the Lord. Again, we see that repetition of an encounter with God, hearing from God, uh, interacting with God, and then building an altar to say, Hey, this is, this is one of those places, one of those places of, of promise and interaction with God. And I want to mark it. And so he builds an altar to the Lord. So this seems like a pretty straightforward 18 verses, chapter 13. They just, they move out of Egypt. They move into the promised land or Canaan at this point. And, you know, the herds are too big. There's fighting going on. So they separate and that's the end of the chapter. Well, you know, there's a whole lot more going on there. And I, I hope we've unpacked some of that. Uh, not the least of which is that chapter ending with a promise to Abram about the land and about his descendants. Let's be thankful to God for his provision that we can trust him, that we need not lean on our own understanding. We need not figure it all out ourselves. We need to look to him and be faithful in following him because it's in his hands. Let's trust in him with every step and see what God is doing. And sometimes even the stuff that looks like hardship, like having to pack up and move to Egypt because there's just not enough food. God actually uses as a blessing for us. 
Let's trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for Christ. That through him, we have, we have seen that promise of a right relationship with God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.